Hello everyone, this is Dr. Vishal Trivedi from Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering IIT Guwahati. And what we were discussing, we were discussing about the uh, molecular biology. And uh, so far what we have discussed, we have discussed about the basics of the biological system. So if you recall in the previous uh, module, we have discussed about the cellular structures, uh, we have discussed about the prokaryotic cells, eukaryotic cells, and then we also discuss about the different types of organelles what are present in the uh, uh, prokaryotic cell and uh, in today's lecture we are going to extend our discussion about the basics of the biological system and in this context uh, we are going to discuss about how the cells are actually going to acquire the energy. So in today's lecture we are going to discuss about the cellular metabolisms and how the cells are performing the different types of metabolic reactions to acquire the energy and how it can actually be able to utilize that energy to synthesize the different types of biomolecules. Now the first question comes uh, why the cell is actually requiring the energy whether it is a uh, prokaryotic cell or whether it is a eukaryotic cell such as the animal cell, plant cell, fungi. Uh, it requires the uh, energy, it requires to run the cellular metabolisms to acquire the energy right because uh, whether it is a prokaryotic cell and prokaryotic cell actually require the uh, you know energy to you know to grow replicate and produce and uh, you will see in the later on in this particular course that there are so many different types of cellular activities which are uh, operating within the cell and that they are very very crucial for maintaining the cell for example one of the crucial factor is the DNA replications and DNA replication is very important because it is uh, actually required not only for synthesis of the new DNA strand but it also requires for the uh, repairing of the damaged DNA and repairing of the damaged DNA is important because it is actually going to protect the organisms for going for the death pathway. So uh, energy is uh, can be acquired from the uh, from the uh, from running the cellular metabolisms, and as far as the cellular metabolism is concerned, we have two different types of cellular metabolisms. We have either the catabolic reactions or the anabolic reactions. Catabolic reactions are, as I said, you know, they are the energy producing reactions. So they, these are the reactions which are actually going to produce the energy. So in this uh, you are actually going to use the biomolecule which is responsible for producing the energy such as the carbohydrate and mostly the lipids. Okay? Uh, these are the two uh, major biomolecules which are being used for producing the energy. Under a very, very strong and very, very starvation conditions, uh, the organisms can also utilize the uh, proteins for the energy production. So in those cases, the protein is going to be get converted into the carbohydrate and lipids and then the, it is actually going to run the catabolic reactions to produce energy. But that is very rare and it happens only under those conditions when you are going through uh, starvation reactions. So, uh, and then once uh, the, you are actually going to do the, uh, the catabolic reactions for the carbohydrate or lipid, you are actually going to produce the energy and that energy would be in the form of the ATP, right? And this energy is actually going to be utilized for the anabolic reaction. So, this, ener this, uh, this uh, energy is actually going to utilize to drive the reaction so that you are actually going to have the synthesis of the new biomolecules. For example, if I want to synthesize a protein, right, and you will see this uh, when we are going to discuss about the biomolecule uh, into the later part of this particular course, that uh, a, a formation of a bond is required, right. So protein is made up of, of the amino acids, right. and uh, these amino acids, for example, the amino acid uh, 1 and it is actually going to be converted, uh, going to be attached to the amino acid 2 by a bond which is called as the peptide bond, right? And you know that the bond formation is always required that you are actually going to spend some amount of energy. So when you spend the energy, 
you are actually going to activate the functional group what is present onto the amino acid number one and to amino acid two and that's how they are actually going to uh, combine together and they are actually going to form a uh, protein okay or peptide for example where they, they are actually going to be linked by a peptide bond. So basically what you cellular metabolism is a submission of all the reactions whether it is the catabolic reaction or the anabolic reactions. Catabolic reactions are required for the production of energy whereas the anabolic reactions are required to utilize this energy for the biosynthesis because once the synthesis is done it is actually going to contribute in terms of the growth of the organisms or the other kinds of functions for example it is actually going to help to produce the gametes it is going to help the produce the you know to give the nutrition to the uh, to the uh, daughter cells and so on right so these two reactions are always been under the uh, uh, coordination to each other and as a result they are actually going to be responsible for the cellular health of the particular cell so uh, let's start first with the catabolic reactions and we are going to start with the carbohydrate metabolisms. So very briefly we are going to discuss about the carbohydrate metabolisms. Then we will discuss about the lipid metabolisms uh, and mostly we are going to discuss about the catabolic reactions. And then uh, we are going to discuss about the anabolic reactions and at the end we are also going to discuss what will how the you know the cellular metabolism is uh, taking care of the toxic products being produced during the catabolic reaction or to the anabolic reactions so when we talk about the carbohydrate metabolism carbohydrate metabolism and you know that the carbohydrate metabolism is going to start once you have any food so for example if i have a food uh, for example if i have the rice right so if I have a rice in the lunch, what will happen is the rice will enter into my stomach, right? And uh, then followed by the stomach, it is actually going to enter into the uh, small intestine. And from its small intestine, it is actually going to enter into the large intestine. And afterwards, it is actually going to be uh, the undigested product is going to be removed from the anus, right? So food, whether it is a rice, right? Rice is a good source of carbohydrate, right? But this carbohydrate is a polymeric carbohydrate, right? So it is actually going to have the starch. Now, starch, you cannot put it into the catabolic reactions. The starch has to be converted into the simple sugar such as uh, glucose and fructose and they, they, they will enter into the catabolic reactions. So first you are going to take the rice, you are put it into the stomach, in the stomach uh, it will actually going to start digested right and from the small intestine the starch is completely going to be get converted into glucose right and the glucose is a monomeric sugar which is uh, going to be ready to be get into the catabolic reactions and then this glucose is going to be absorbed by the villi and the microvilli what is present onto the small intestine cell surface and they are actually going to be present into the blood right so once they are absorbed they are going to put into the blood and from the blood it will enter into the different organs so it is actually going to enter into the liver it is actually going to enter into the muscles and so on so brain spleen and all that okay so all the organs it is actually going to be get distributed and within the liver muscle spleen brain um, uh, nervous tissues and all other all these places the this glucose is actually going to be utilized for running the carbohydrate uh, catabolic reactions and they at the end they are actually going to produce the energy right and when you have the excess amount of glucose that glucose is going to be stored in the form of the glycogen 
within the different types of uh, tissues. So that when you are going to do the starvation, that look like ogen is getting converted into the glucose and that's how actually it is actually going to provide you the running force for the moment when you are not taking the nutrition from outside. So for example, when you sleep in the night, you are going to take the dinner, right? But that dinner is actually going to serve the food for few hours. After that, it is actually going to start utilizing the uh, stored material what is present in your liver, muscles, spleen and brain. Uh, so these are the catabolic reaction what is going to be utilized, right? And uh, they will be utilized to produce the energy and that energy is actually going to uh, utilized for running the uh, normal reactions what is going to be performed by the different organs or uh, they are actually going to be utilized for biosynthetic pathway. Now, as far as uh, carbohydrate it, but, uh, is uh, concerned, uh, it is actually going to be the central uh, carb, uh, pathway for uh, uh, central pathway for catabolism. So that's why it is actually very important that we should understand the carbohydrate metabolism. So carbohydrate metabolism is in the central, right? As far as the catabolic reaction is concerned, and majority of the pathways are actually getting diverged from the carbohydrate metabolism. Now, once the glucose is produced, it will enter into the different types of organs and within the different types of organs, it is actually going to first uh, into a series of reactions, which is called as the glycolysis. And uh, at the end of the glycolysis, it is actually going to produce the pyruvic acid and that pyruvic acid will enter into another cyclic reaction which is called as the Krebs cycle. So uh, in today's lecture, we will discuss about the catabolic reactions such as the glycolysis and the Krebs cycle. So glycolysis, uh, glycolysis is a central pathway to the carbohydrate metabolism and it is the universal pathway which is found in the prokaryote or the eukaryotic cell. It is a breakdown of a six-membered glucose into the two three-membered carbon sugar to feed the carbon to create cycle in the presence of oxygen. So you can have the two different scenarios. When you have the oxygen present, such as uh, the organisms like us, and uh, it can be also be you know functional even if you don't have the oxygen, right? So if it is uh, present in the present, uh, if it, in the presence of oxygen, the glucose is getting converted into a two, three-membered carbon sugar, and that is go enter into the Krebs cycle, or it is actually going to send for the anaerobic oxidation in the in the absence of oxygen. So in the different types of uh, pathogenic organisms like bacteria and other kinds of organisms, when the oxygen is limiting it will not going to be uh, get converted into the pyruvic acid. Instead of that, it is actually going to be get converted into the anaerobic products. And that's how they will, these organisms are also going to survive. So hence, it is play a pretty crucial role for the adaptation of a living organism under the different types of stress conditions. The glycolysis is a 10 step chemical reaction to enable the glucose for its optimal oxidations. So glycolysis is a 10 step reaction, right? And these are the 10 steps, right? You have the uh, step number one, two, three, four, five, and in the 10th step, you are going to generate the pyruvate. So this is the step number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10, okay? So in the step number one, you are actually going to do the activation of the glucose molecule. So you are actually going to do the activation of glucose molecule, okay? Because you have to invest some energy so that the glucose will be destabilized because once you uh, add the phosphorylated group to the glucose molecule, it is actually going to contain the very high energy. And when it contains the high energy, 
the high energy is always making the system unstable. So phosphorylation of the glucose. So the glucose produced after the glycogen breakdown is phosphorylated by the enzyme which is called as the glucokinase. Remember that glucokinase is only present in the liver whereas the hexokinase is present in the all other tissues especially in the muscles. So in most of the uh, organs such as brain, spleen, uh, muscles, it is hexokinase which is the major uh, enzyme which is going to catalyze the reaction number one. But in the case of liver, it is actually going to be the glucokinase. So in the phosphorylation reactions, uh, in the phosphorylation reaction, the phosphate that is a gamma phosphate group of ATP is transferred to the glucose to form the glucose 6-phosphate. The phosphorylation reaction of glucose to produce the glucose 6-phosphate mark the molecule for the glycolysis and in this process, the one molecule of ATP is utilized in the step. So once the glucose, which is uh, unphosphorylated, so this glucose is actually going to be produced from the uh, glycogen, right? So remember that I told, talk about the stored glycogen, right? So once the, you require the energy, the glycogen is going to be broken down and it is actually going to form the glucose. This glucose can participate in the different types of reactions. So to commit this glucose for the, uh, for the carbohydrate metabolism or the uh, catabolic reactions, what you are going to do is you are going to take the glucose and with the help of the hexokinase or the glucokinase, it is going to be get converted into glucose 6-phosphate. Once you generate the glucose 6-phosphate, there is a big difference. This is the neutral molecule, right? There is no charge on the glucose molecule. Whereas once you generate the glucose 6-phosphate, this is actually going to be the negatively charged molecule right and once you generate a negatively charged molecule you are actually going to trap the molecule uh, within the cell right because a charged molecule cannot be freely available to go out of the cell right because the charged molecule the movement of a charged molecule from out of from the cell requires the energy right so this means and glucose 6-phosphate is going to be uh, entrapped within the cell and then it is actually going to be committed for no other reaction but the glycolysis and then it will actually going to do the uh, reaction number two. Now, in the step number two, there will be a conversion of glucose 6-phosphate to the fructose 6-phosphate because you are going to have the isomerization reaction. So, in the step number two, the glucose 6-phosphate, what you have generated from the glucose is going to be get converted into fructose 6-phosphate and the enzyme what is going to catalyze this reaction is called as a phosphofructo isomerase. Now in the step number 3, another series of oxidation is or another series of phosphorylation is going to be take place in the step number 3. So in the step number 3, uh, you are going to have the uh, the uh, you know the phosphofructokinase catalyzing the another round of uh, phosphorylation. So you have first phosphorylation here and you have the second phosphorylation here and as a result you are going to generate a molecule which is called as fructose 1,6 bisphosphate and this molecule is a very high energy molecule and very unstable molecule. So uh, in the step number 3, the sugar is further phosphorylated at the carbon number 1 to produce the fructose 1,6-bisphosphate by the action of an enzyme which is called as phosphofructokinase. In the uh, phosphorylation reactions, the phosphate that is the gamma phosphate group of ATP is transferred to the phosphorylated sugar to form the fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. One molecule of ATP is utilized in the this step. So remember that we have utilized one ATP here and one ATP in the reaction number three. Now, once the fructose one six bisphosphate is generated, which is actually be a very 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 unstable molecule, it is actually going to be act by the aldolase in the reaction number four. So in the reaction number four, 
the aldo lace is actually going to break or it is actually going to uh, you know uh, break the molecule into the two different molecule the glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate or the dihydroxy acetone phosphate so in the step number 4 there will be a cleavage of fructose 1 6 bis phosphate and this step is catalyzed by an enzyme which is called as the aldolase or fructose 1 6 bis aldolase to generate the glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate which is called the aldose and the dihydroxy acetone phosphate which is called as the ketose so there will be a cleavage of this high energy bond right remember that at until this you have the six membered carbon mem six membered ring right now at this stage it is actually going to be get converted into the three membered ring and uh, that is a cleavage of the sugar molecule now in the step 5 uh, in the step 5 this is the step number 4 right you are going to have the isomerization reactions and the conversion of the uh, the dihydroxy acetone phosphate to the glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate so interconversion of the triose phosphates so three carbon sugar form in the step 4 undergoes the internal conversions as the glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate can readily be entered into the next step the ketose generated in the step 4 is reversibly connected converted into the glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate by the triose 3 phosphate isomerase so this is also a very very important enzyme uh, because it is actually going to convert the dihydroxy acetone phosphate into the glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate and now afterwards so it is actually going to generate the two molecules of glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate remember that from fructose 16 phosphate with phosphate aldolase is actually going to break this into the glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate and the dihydroxy acetone phosphate so it is actually going to generate the one molecule of this and one molecule of this but with the action of phosphotriose esterase this molecule is getting converted into this and as a result of this the two molecule of glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate is going to be generated from the fructose 16 with phosphate now in the step number 6 okay this is the first time when you are actually going to see a generation of the atp right so you are going to see the generation of the reducing equivalents and these reducing equivalents are actually going to produce the atp so in the step 6 what you are going to do so this is the step number 6 what you are going to do is you are going to see the dehydrogenase reactions and there will be a generation of the reducing equivalents so in the step 6 the glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate the glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate is going to be get converted into the 13 bis phosphoglycerate and in this step the one molecule of nadh is produced after the oxidation of the aldehyde group of the glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate with the help of the enzyme glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate dehydrogenase this enzyme is very important for the many types of the therapeutic applications such as generation of the different types of uh, drugs and all the kinds of thing because this is the enzyme which is actually going to be first time going to produce the reducing equivalent and these reducing equivalents when they will put into the electron transport chain they are actually going to produce the atp so that's why if you uh mutate or if you you know uh, inhibit this particular enzyme you are actually going to destroy the glycolysis and you are also going to uh, you know block the production of the energy even in those organism where the oxygen uh, in the absence of oxygen the glycolysis is going to be keep running and keep giving them the enough energy so that they can be able to survive under the stress conditions now once you generated the 13 bis phosphoglycerate from the glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate it will enter into the next reaction and the next reaction is the seventh reaction right so in the step 7 in this step the phosphate group from the 13 bis phosphoglycerate is removed by the phosphoglycerate kinase with an acyl group transferred to the adp to generate the atp molecule so in this is the first step where you are directly going to see a generation of the atp molecule and this is the enzyme 
which is actually be responsible for generation of the first ATP molecule. And uh, one three bis phosphoglycerate is going to be get converted into three phosphoglycerate, and the phosphate what is present on the carbon one is actually going to be taken up by the ADP molecule, and as a result, it is actually going to generate the ATP molecule. So it is this is the step number seven, which is actually the step which is going to generate the energy first time. Okay, remember that in the step number six also you have generated the energy, but that is indirect energy. It is actually going to get into the electron transport chain and then it is actually going to produce the ATP. But here directly you are going to get the ATP molecules. Now from the three phosphoglycerate, it there will be uh, isomerization reactions and it is actually going to get converted into the two phosphoglycerate. So in the step number eight, you are going to have the conversion of the three phosphoglycerate to the two phosphoglycerate, which means there will be a change of the position of the phosphate group within the molecule. And this reaction is going to be catalyzed by an enzyme which is called as the phosphoglycerate mutase and it is actually going to form the 2 phosphoglycerate. Now in the step number 9 there will be a dehydration of the 2 phosphoglycerate to phosphoenol pyruvate. The enzyme enolase catalyzes the dehydration reaction to produce the phosphoenol pyruvate a compound with a high phosphoryl group transfer potential. So now from the 2 phosphoglycerate, the enolase is actually going to remove the one molecule of the water and as a result, it is actually going to form the phosphoenol pyruvate. And from the step number 10, which is the last step of the reaction, so this is the step number 9, this is the step number 10, the phosphoenol pyruvate is actually going to give up the another carb, uh, uh, phosphate and as a result, it is actually going to generate the pyruvate and the enzyme phosphoryruvate kinase. And here again, you are actually going to produce the direct energy, which means it is actually going to produce the instant energy and it is actually going to produce the ATC. So the first time you have produced the energy here and the second time you are going to produce the energy here. And uh, in the step number 10, the phosphate group from the phosphoenol pyruvate is transferred by the pyruvate kinase with an acyl group, phosphate group transfer to the ATP to generate the ATP molecule. Now, this is the glycolysis uh, ATP balance sheet. And what you see here is that I have given you that how much amount of it, uh, investment and what will be the production. So in the investment, remember that in the step number one to four, there is an investment of two ATP molecule because you are utilizing the ATP molecule in the step number one and in the step number three, right? Now, once you have invested the two ATP molecule because you have activated with the, in the step number one, you have activated the molecule and you have uh, phosphorylated the glucose so that it will be committed for the glycolysis. And in the step number two, you have phosphorylated fructose 6-phosphate so that it will be going to produce the fructose 1,6-bis phosphate and it is actually going to be uh, ready for the uh, for the cleavage reactions. And fructose 1,6-bis phosphate is a very, very high energy unstable molecule. So once you generated the unstable molecule, it will actually going to go into the downstream reaction. So in the step number 6, uh, the, the ATP is actually going to be produced, NADH is actually going to be produced and that NADH when it goes into the electron transport chain, it is actually going to give you the ATP molecule. Then in the step number 7, there will be a generation of ATP right when you are uh, leaving the one uh, ATP molecule uh, to the uh, one phosphate group to the ADP. And in the step number 10, which is the final step, uh, phosphoenol pyruvate is also giving one phosphate molecule to the ADP. And that's how you are actually going to have the two different types of ATP molecule. And remember that after the step number uh, 5, you have the cleavage of the fructose 1,6-bis phosphate, right, to the glycerol dehyde 3 phosphate and dihydrogenase phosphate, right. So you are actually going to have the two 
molecules of the glycerol dihydrogen phosphate so the one molecule when will going to process it is going to produce the one molecule of nadh one molecule of atp and one molecule of atp in this but since you have two molecules of nadh uh, two molecules of glycerol dihydrogen phosphate it is actually going to produce the two molecules of nadh and when the two molecules of nadh is going to process it is going to generate the uh, six molecules of atp and uh, in the step number 7 and 10 it is also going to generate the uh, two two molecules so uh, totality what you are going to see here is that this is the final balance sheet so six is from the nadh two is uh, from the reaction number 6 and two is from the reaction number 10 and these are the two reaction two atp what you have actually invested so at the end you are actually going to have the eight atp molecules so at the end of the carbo uh, glycolysis if you have the oxygen present right if you have the oxygen present one molecule of glucose is actually going to give you the eight atp molecules okay now if it is a reaction it is actually going to be regulated by many methods so one of the major method is that you are actually going to uh, regulate the level of glucose and that is always been done by the different types of hormones you know that the different types of hormones are regulating the concentration of the glucose within the blood and outside in within the cell also and one of the such hormone is called as insulin hormone right and insulin actually binds to a receptor which is called as the insulin receptor and these are the protein tyrosine uh, based receptors and they will actually going to you know drive the reaction inside the cell in such a way that it is actually going to down regulate the glucose so it will actually going to uh, enhance the uptake of the glucose right so what happen is that when you have the uh, insulin binding to the insulin receptor it is actually triggering the opening of the glucose transporters so you have a glucose transporter and they are actually going to increase the entry of the glucose inside the cell and once they are actually going to enter inside the cell uh, so they will be going to take up the glucose they will be going to take inside and then they will recycle and go back right uh, so in the step number 1 the insulin will bind to the receptor into the cell membrane and activated receptor promote the recruitment of glucose transported from the intracellular pool to the cell membrane so once that happens you are actually going to have a very high concentration of the glucose transporter such as glut3 and glut4 and they will actually going to get uh, enhance the uptake of glucose from the blood stream and once it enters and suppose the glucose is uh, less then what will happen is that these transporters are actually going to be taken up into the intracellular vesicles and uh, by doing this it is actually going to regulate the level of glucose into the blood apart from this the glycolysis can also be regulated at the level of the feedback mechanism and as well as the covalent modifications so this is the co example of the covalent modification and this is the example of the allosteric regulations and uh, i'm not going to discuss in detail about this because um, this course is more about the molecular biology but what will happen is that in the case of the covalent modifications the the pyruvate kinase which is actually the enzyme that the catalyzing the 10th reactions can be present in two different forms it can be a phosphorylated form or it can be a dephosphorylated form the dephosphorylated or i will say the native enzyme is actually very active but when it gets phosphorylated it becomes less active so because of this it can actually be able to get modulated by the different types of parameters for example if there will be a low blood glucose okay if there will be a lo low blood glucose it is actually going to 
uh, drive the reaction in such a way that it is actually going to uh, uh, you know uh, uh, convert the uh, dephosphorylated pyruvate kinase to the uh, phosphorylated pyruvate kinase and so on. Uh, apart from that, you are also going to have the uh, modulations either by the fructose one sig bisphosphate, the level of fructose one sig bisphosphate, and the ATP and alanine. So, ATP, if there is a sufficient quantity of ATP what is present inside the cell, uh, it is actually going to uh, down regulate the activity of these enzymes. Whereas, if you, the level of fructose 1 6 phosphate, bisphosphate is very high, it is actually going to increase the activity of this particular enzyme. Same is true when you are talking about the allosteric regulations. So, here also you have the many types of allosteric regulators. So, phosphofractokinase uh, uh, is actually an enzyme which is going to be allosterically be regulated by the fructose 2 6 bisphosphate. So, uh, uh, what is mean by the allosteric regulation is that the, uh, the molecule will not going to bind to the active site, but it will bind to a allosteric site. And because of that, either it will increase the activity of that particular enzyme or it will actually going to decrease the activity of that enzyme. And uh, uh, either of these ways, the, uh, you are actually going to see or you are going to be able to regulate the enzyme activity and at the end you are going to regulate the glycolysis. Now, from the glycolysis, the glucose is going to be get converted into the pyruvate, right? Now, this pyruvate will enter into another chain, another reaction which is called as the Krebs cycle and Krebs cycle is a 10 reaction uh, cycle, okay? So, the Krebs cycle as the name suggests, the Krebs is the name of the scientist and the Krebs cycle is discovered by Professor Hens Krebs and it has all sugar intermediate with the three carbons. Remember that in the carb in the glycolysis we have we have started with the six carbon and then it will enter into the three carbon. Whereas in this case all the carbohydrates are of three carbon sugar. It is also known as the tricarboxylic acid or the citric acid cycle. In higher eukaryotes, the Krebs cycle operates inside the mitochondrial stroma with the different enzyme. In the presence of oxygen, the pyruvate formed during glycolysis enter into the Krebs cycle for further oxidation to produce the energy. So what we have is we have the pyruvate, right? So this pyruvate is coming from the uh, glucose uh, from the glycolysis, right? Now, this pyruvate is going to be entered into the Krebs cycle. So, it will get converted into the acetyl CoA, and pyruvate is actually going to uh, convert it into acetyl CoA with the enzyme which is called as pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. This is a multimeric enzyme complex and it requires the um, different types of uh, cofactors like TPP, lipoid. And in this process, one molecule of NADH is actually going to be produced. Now, acetyl-CoA is actually going to enter into the Krebs cycle. So, this is actually the Krebs cycle, right? And uh, the acetyl-CoA is going to be combined with the water and it is actually going to form the citrate and the enzyme is citrate synthase. So, this is the reaction number one, okay? Well, now, from the, cit from the citrate, you are going to have the two reactions of the dehydration reactions. So, in the first step of dehydration, when the first molecule of hydro water is going to be removed by the enzyme aconitase, it is actually going to form the cis aconitase. And from the cis aconitase, when there will be another round of removal of water, it is actually going to form the isocitrate, okay? So, this is the reaction number 2, this is the reaction number 3 and now in the reaction number 4, the isocitrate is going to be get converted into oxalosuccinate and the one molecule of NADH is actually going to be produced and the enzyme which is going to catalyze this reaction is called as the isocitrate dehydrogenase. Now, from the oxalosuccinate, 
uh, it is going to be there will be a decarboxylation reactions and as a result there will be a removal of carbon dioxide and that's how it is actually going to form the alpha keto glutarate and uh, the enzyme is isocytrate dehydrogenase and uh, from the alpha keto glutarate there will be a uh, generation of the NADH molecule and the there will be a uh, removal of the decarboxylation reaction so it is going to produce the one molecule of carbon dioxide and there will be a generation of NADH molecule and the enzyme which is going to catalyze the conversion of the alpha keto glutarate to succinyl coa is the alpha keto uh, alpha keto glutarate dehydrogenase now from the succinyl coa you are actually going to generate the succinate and in this process it is actually going to produce the one molecule of gtp remember that the gtp is uh, of the same energy as the atp okay uh, and then it, this enzyme, this reaction is going to be catalyzed by an enzyme which is called as succinate thiokinase. Now, well, from succinate, it is actually going to form the fumarate, and the enzyme is succinate de dehydrogenase. And in this process, the one molecule of FADH2 is going to be produced. And from the fumarate, it is actually going to form the malate, and the enzyme is called as fumarase. And there will be a removal. There will be a, uh, uh, and then from the there will be a removal of water, right, from the malate to generate the fumarate. So there will be a, a hydration reactions, and from the malate it is actually going to form the oxaloacetate. And in this process also there will be a generation of the NADH molecule. And the enzyme which is going to catalyze this reaction is called as malate dehydrogenase. And again. The oxaloacetate is going to combine with the uh, acetyl CoA from the pyruvate to form the citrate, and that's how it is actually going to complete the reactions. So this is the step number four. This is step number five. This is the step number six. This is step number seven, eight, nine, and this is the step number ten. Okay. So by doing this cyclic reactions you are actually going to be utilized the one glucose molecule completely and you are going to oxidize that into the uh, into the form of the ATP and NADH and as a result you are going to produce a very high quantity of energy especially when you are actually going to have the enormous amount of oxygen present so that you can be able to run the electron transport chain optimally. So let's see how much energy you are going to produce. So uh, in the there will there's no investment as far as the trade cycle is concerned, right? Because you are not going to invest any ATP molecule. You have already invested ATP molecule if you're talking about the glycolysis. But once you activated the glucose molecule for the carbohydrate catabolic reactions, then it is fine. So in the Step number one, there will be a production of style CoA, right? When the pyruvate is getting converted into style CoA, and that's how it is actually going. So there is a one generation of NADH molecule, and the NADH molecule is going to give you the three ATP molecule. Then in the step number three, there will be a generation of the alpha glutarate, and then also you are going to have the one molecule of NADH. So here you have one molecule of NADH. Here also you have one molecule of NADH. Then in the step number four, there will be a generation of succinyl CoA. There also you are going to have the uh, NADH molecule, right? Then you also have the generation of GTP. So GTP is also having the same energy as the ATP. So there will be one ATP molecule which is going to be produced. And then in the step number six, there will be a generation of fumarate. So there will be a generation of FADH2 rather than NADH and it is actually going to give you the two molecules. So the, here you are going to have the FADH and uh, and the step number gen 8 there will be a generation of oxaloacetate so that also is going to give you the one molecule of NADH okay. So at the end what you see here is this is the net balance of the oxidation of one pyruvate molecule and it is actually going to give you the 15 ATP molecule and since from one glucose molecule you are producing the two pyruvate molecule so it is actually going to generate the 30 ATP molecules right uh, now 
because so at the end if you talk about the glucose and if there is a ampule amount of oxygen present what will happen is that the with the help of the uh, glycolysis it is actually going to produce the 8 ATP molecule and with the help of the Krebs cycle it is actually going to produce the 30 ATP molecule and at the end from the one glucose molecule you are going to produce the 38 ATP molecule that only when you are actually having the oxygen present if there is a no oxygen present then the production of ATP from the glycolysis and as well as the production of ATP from the Krebs cycle is actually going to be reduced because majority of these NADH molecule or the FADH molecule will not going to enter into the Krebs cycle for the oxidation and as a result they will not going to produce any energy if the oxygen is not produced and same is true for the uh, for the glycolysis. So here there is a question comes what would be the what would be the amount of ATP produced when you do not have the oxygen okay that you are actually going to figure out and you can have to tell me. Now how you are going to regulate the Krebs cycle so regulation of the Krebs cycle can be done at the four level one is you can actually have the uh, conversion of pyruvate into acetyl CoA is the first step which allows the entry of sugar moiety into the Krebs cycle and the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex is aerosterically inhibited by the high ratio of ATP to ADP, NADH and acetyl CoA which means if you have high quantity of energy uh, whether in the form of the ATP or whether in the form of the reducing equivalent then you are actually going to steric, uh, uh, allosterically going to reduce the activity of the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. So if you have the ATP, you have NADH, you have a style OA or if you have enough quantity of fatty acids then you are not going to uh, run the uh, carbohydrate metabolism then you are actually going to take this fatty acid and directly enter into the Krebs cycle and run it right. Uh, on the other hand, if you have the very high quantity of NADH, FAD plus, acetyl CoA or calcium, then you are actually going to increase the activity of this activity and the more of the pyruvate is getting converted into the acetyl CoA because it is actually allosterically going to enhance the activity of the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. Then the first reaction of the trade cycle is catalyzed by the citrate synthase is inhibited by the high level of NADH, ATP and succinyl CoA. So the first reaction is also going to be uh, modulated by the presence of the ATP, NADH, style CoA or fatty acids, right? The same logic, if you have a high quantity of energy, then you would not like to run the Krebs cycle. Then we have the isolated dehydrogenase, which is also going to be regulated by the ATP and NADH. Whereas in the case of ATP, ADP and calcium, it is actually going to increase the activity. And then we have the alpha ketoglutarate, which is actually going to be inhibited by the succinyl CoA and the high level NADH, whereas the calcium stimulates the system. So this is what is given here. Now, Krebs cycle is a central uh, metabolic pathway, right? As I said, you know, carbohydrate metabolism is a central metabolic pathway, right? And that's why it communicates with the many types of uh, metabolic pathways so that they can be able to make the good coordination. For example, you should not, you don't want that, that there will be a enhanced production of the isocitrate. And on the other hand, if one reaction requires the isocitrate for its own uh, you know, for 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 as a as a, um, as a as a reactant, right? Then you should take the isocitrate from here and put it into that, right? So that's why the Krebs cycle is a central metabolic pathway, mm -hmm. and it actually requires the metabolites for the different types of the other carbohydrate, other metabolic pathway as well. And that's why what you see here is that the TCA cycle or the tricarboxylic acid cycle is having the different types of intermediate. For example, it has citrate, it has the alpha glutarate succinyl coa malate and the oxaloacetate. And what you see here is that if the citrate, citrate is actually uh, communicating with the fatty acid and steroid because citrate can be used in that particular biosynthetic pathway. 
same is true for the alpha glutarate it can actually be able to communicate with the synthesis of the uh, amino acids like glutamate and when the glutamate is formed it can actually be able to generate the glutamine proline and arginine all these you are actually going to see when we are going to discuss about the uh, anaerobic oxidation uh, when we are going to discuss about the anabolic reactions same is true from here also how the oxaloacetate is communicating with the phosphoenal pyruvate, uh, glycine, serine and all that. And uh, carbohydrate and the fat metabolism is also very actively uh, interacting with the different types of intermediate what are present in the TCS cycle. Uh, and the Krebs cycle because it is a it is a central metabolic pathway it is a master regulator of metabolism because it can you know regulate not only the carbohydrate metabolism but also the metabolism of the uh, other metabolic pathways such as fatty acid biosynthesis pathway fatty acid oxidations uh, protein synthesis and the nucleoid synthesis right so this is all about the uh, about the catabolic reactions of the carbohydrate metabolism in our subsequent uh, lectures we are going to discuss about the uh, catabolic reactions of the fatty acids and then we are going to move on to discuss about the anabolic reactions and how the energy what you are going to generate into the catabolic reaction is going to be utilized into the anabolic reaction for the uh, synthesis of the biomolecules. So with this, I would like to conclude my lecture here. In our subsequent lecture, we are going to discuss more about the uh, catabolic reactions of the lipids and as well as the anabolic reactions uh, of the other biomolecules. Thank you. Mm -hmm.